canine teeth, tongue sticking out, uh, legs and paws with claws and a long tail, and a, a, a well-fed wolf. Mountain goat, just really having a good time um, just laying out designs with the kids. We did this um, almost every single day that we were together up until near the end of working on the pole when we just wanted to really dig into it and, and get moving. And understanding, you know, abstraction to uh, a higher degree and a little bit more natural form. Just kind of breaking down the different ways of creating a design. So, um, something I like to tell all my kids when we're working in with uh, sharp tools and wood is that anyone can carve. Anyone can take a sharp tool and remove material. The difference between um, anyone and a carver is the carver knows when to stop digging a hole. <laughs> Um, here you can see we've got a lot more blocking in done. Um, in the original design, I had the kids just standing in just pure figured form. And um, I did these, this house pose for Gold Bell Heritage and they thought that it would be a little bit awkward to have naked kids on the pole. And I was like, what makes you think they're naked? They could be wearing clothes. They have blue jeans on them. Um, but they decided that the kids should be uh, have dance robes on them. So I changed the design up and put some uh, dance robe on there. And you can see here, I've got opened up here in the middle where you've got a knee and a foot sticking out. Um, and so the kids are, bodies are facing each other and their heads are turned back and their arms are up over their head in a dance pose. And you can see the arm right up here and the head here and the eagle way up there. Getting things more blocked in. You can see where the beak is, the eye socket, a nice little cheek here, and the wing coming up around here. I'm trying to make this bird look a little bit more regal. And uh, yeah, faces are hard. Um, one of my favorite things to carve really are uh, masks and small faces, large faces. Um, not because it's an easy thing to carve, but because it always presents a really great challenge. Uh, understanding the symmetry, facial features, um, and uh, just reading the wood and, and working with the wood, trying to understand it so I can get it to do what I want. And here you can see the feeder and legs are blocked in more and the arm coming out here and the head kind of being drawn in and the rope being distinctive from the, the head and a little bit of the wing being blocked in. And more drawing, always more drawing, having lots of fun. Here you can see the beaver with its checkered tail, big bunny teeth in the front. The beaver is usually depicted um, with a stick either in its paws or in its mouth. Um, and uh, I don't know about the kids, but drawing was always relaxing for me. Here we have a very fat and happy walrus with lots and lots of clams. <laughs> And every day we are we dig, 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 all day through. Um, kids worked really, really hard on this uh, pole. It was really great to um, see them come in excited, um, eager to um, to really dig in into the pole and and work with the tools. And um, they repeatedly got yelled at. Don't hold the tool that way. Move your hand. Both hands on the knife. See this right here? This was about five seconds after I yelled at him for <laughs> holding the, the tool with one hand and his other hand holding the pole down. It's like, the pole's not gonna move. Both hands on the tool. Um, 
I think he had like five band-aids <laughs> over the course of this project. Only one of them was from a sliver. Um, and then they're learning more and more about the wood grain, um, digging in deeper, setting in um, distinctive areas here between the, the leg and the wing, and understanding how to carve with the wood grain rather than against it. Um, with a lot of interesting tools, hard to reach angles. Uh, this was a really big challenging project for them. And uh, I was really proud of how hard they all worked um, in carving this project. Is it yellow or red cedar? Red cedar, yes. Much lighter. Again, more having fun and drawing. People always ask me, can you draw a puffin? There's a puffin. <laughs> And a blue heron. And a stellar jay. Just really having fun with the kids. Um, kind of exploring uh, the world and understanding form line. And uh, just finding ways to, to keep them excited and interested um, in continuing on with the work. Here we've got more details coming in. You can see the knees and the feet are more um, defined. The robe is becoming more defined. And they're working up in here on the, uh, the feet and the top of the head. And starting to block in the faces of the kids. Um, I asked the kids if they wanted to work on these uh, faces with me and they looked at me and they all shook their heads. No, we'll just watch and learn. Say, like, okay. So they left the faces to me. So this is the starting end of the blocking end of, uh, this is be the boy's face on this side. And more work on the eagle here. You can see the mouth, the beak is more defined here. I'm getting the eyes carved in more. Got a nice curve here on the beak going and starting to show them how, where the lines are going to be on the top part of the wing. And then this was exciting for the kids the day that we started carving in the toes on the eagle. Um, they did a really good job on those in the end. This is just blocking them in. Um, and these here, I was able to describe verbally what I wanted and then set them loose, and that is what they were carving on their own. Here's uh, some of the tools we used. Um, this is a combination of commercial tools, a lot of commercial tools, and uh, handmade tools. And all of those tools are very, very, very sharp. Ask any one of them, they'll tell you. It goes into the skin really easily. Here we can see fingers. The pole is waving hot. We have a lot of things blocked in here. The face is blocked in, you can see the detail. We have the box down here, you can see where the lid is for the box. We have the wing uh, detail being carved in. The face is very distinctive on the eagle, and um, the wing is very defined here. And we're getting some of the background carved down so that it helps the, the figures to stand out more. And here we have the toes being carved more. Um, this is Erin. She did most of the carving on the toes uh, herself, and she was very, very proud of the work that she had done. And I was very proud of her for the work that she had done. Um, she graduated high school last year. And you can see here on this side here, this is the little girl. Um, and the features here would be carved a little bit more uh, sleek and feminine. And also, um, women usually had a little regret in their lip. And um, so I've got the lip extending down a little bit here to kind of show that. 
And you can see how the features are being carved in with the jaw, the fingers, the eyes, big schnoz. We've got some ears going here. And at this point, I got the kids to help me out more with the carving of uh, at least the hair and with the carving of the hands and the arms of the kids. Um, they still wouldn't touch anywhere near this though. Um, <laughs> they were afraid to mess that up. And then carving down in this area here was always really uh, fun little nooks and crannies to get into. Um, getting uh, the wings here detail carved in, which is always really fun. Um, getting the nose on the beak carved in and getting that mouth really defined. And yeah, she did a really great job carving the claws on the eagle. I was very, very happy with the work that she had done. She's got a really nice scar in her hand too from the first time I worked with her. And you can see the features are a lot uh, finer, a little bit more petite and um, flowy and the lips are really starting to stand out there. Another detail shot. really coming together. And the kids did most of the work carving on this rope, getting it planed out, smoothed out, rounded off, um, and all the work in here as well. Um, they didn't know that carving the background could be just as difficult as carving uh, all of the foreground area. Here you can see the fingers really starting to take shape. Look at those toes, aren't those great? I love those toes. <laughs> and now we're coming into uh, what kind of robe that the kids are gonna be wearing. Um, you can see here the, the uh, fringe um, carved in here now. And you can see more of what the box looks like here. Here's the box, it's got a base on it down here, and here's the lid. Um, and this is really coming together. This is a uh, Chilkat style robes that I had the kids wearing, um, which you can see an example of right over here in the back. And more details here. I've got detail carved into the wings now. Um, the kids really had fun learning how to do some of the bas relief carving, um, including with the carving of the ovoid here inside of the wing um, and inside of the hands. And we take our work very seriously. I don't know if you can see that, but I had a couple really nice long wood chips she stuck in her hat. <laughs> About the only picture I got anybody to pose for. Um, the tree that this came from was um, part of uh, the totem poles that Goldbelt Heritage had raised both at um, uh, Gaspinel Elementary School and at Savico Park um, or Sandy Beach <coughs> over there in Juneau. And so these um, eight foot posts had been uh, roughed into shape earlier and then they painted them uh, red to seal the wood so that it wouldn't dry out and crack quite as badly. Um, I started carving off some of the red paint in specific areas here. This is all adds texture work on here on both runners, you can see. Um, and that was so that you didn't see the red paint um, and, uh, and when you were transporting it or moving it around, it didn't leave red residue everywhere. And there was also a bunch right along the edge here and it took all that off as well. He, uh, 
noticed I was taking his picture right after I took his picture, so I got away with this one. Um, but he is carving some exacting detail here uh, in the wing um, and really going to town on it. Once we get all the detail carved in, we can start working on our painting. Um, and when we paint, we can also find areas that we would, oops, we missed that spot, uh, and go back and do some cleanup work. Carving the, our painting, the bedwood box with an actual bedwood box style designs. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of lines. What kind of paint do you use? Um, use acrylic paint. This is going to be an indoor house post. So it doesn't require uh, heavy duty house paint um, like you would use for an outdoor post. It's really fun trying to teach the kids how to paint. It's like long, smooth strokes. No, you're not sketching. <laughs> and it's hard to see here, but I have a little piece of abalone inlaid in her lip now. see how things are really starting to come together up in here. Everything's being defined. This was, this was really the fun part of the project where the kids really got to see all of their work coming together um, and watching everything that they worked on really start to stand out. Um, because when you're just looking at red cedar gray, it gets to be a little bit uh, numbing to the eyeballs. You can really start to see everything coming together. That's a really awkward angle. <laughs> and here they are painting hard. Paying very close attention to what they're doing. I think they were concentrating harder on the painting than they were on the carving at times, which is good. And I've got some turquoise coming out into the eyes up here, and you can see the hair is being painted in finally. I've got almost all of this here painted in. And that green really started to make things pop. <coughs> Uh, the kids kept asking me, what are we doing? What are we doing? What are colors are we using? Where are we putting color? How does this work? So one of the things that I did was I took pictures of the poles as they were and I went home, printed them out and uh, just colored them in with some ink. I uh, went over all the pen, was able to help them to see and visualize the uh, designs better. You can see I've got the robes drawn in hear uh, an idea of what I want to do with the rope designs um, and I brought this in for them they're like oh well that's so cool I know you like it so robes are really hard to design really hard to design um, but I had a lot of fun doing this um, and I actually ended up having a really great conversation uh, with Lily Hope uh, over this part of uh, the, the house post, um, talking about the uh, design here. And it was actually in this picture here that I happened to post online that she actually called me up and said, we need to talk. Um, you can see here, I've got all of this detail in, and she told me that the blue and the yellow are not allowed to touch the white. Mm -hmm. And you need to do something about that. And so we talked and here we go. I've got black lines around all of it. Mm -hmm. That was an extra hour, hour and a half of um, nerve wracking uh, <coughs> work. Um, not wanting to slip up anywhere. That cheek there looks a little bit rough because if you remember, there's a big knot right there. But uh, I showed this to her and she was like, yeah, 
That looks really nice now. Thank you. Yes. Um, but these were really fun to get painted. So here we are. Um, the house post is finished. I finished it uh, about five, six days before we presented it to Harborview Elementary School. Um, here it is standing up in their gymnasium uh, just before the, uh, just after we had um, the gifting ceremony there at the school. Funny thing, um, Sunday night, I got a phone call from the project director at Gold Belt Heritage and uh, he had given me a whole bunch of red cedar to make into Bentwood boxes. And he asked if I had one of the big boxes finished yet. Um, I said, no, why? He's like, well, we wanted to give one to Thunder Mountain High School uh, during this gifting ceremony, which is taking place on Thursday um, <laughs> after lunch. And um, could you have one done by then? Um, I had, at that moment, had the boards bent. Uh, so that night I had the, the lid and the base fitted. Um, I paid a friend of mine to carve, hollow out the lid because the board wasn't completely dry. Um, so before I did a final fitting with the lid, we hollowed out the inside of the lid and we set it up over the heater in my apartment to kind of quickly dry it. It got hot in my apartment. My kids complained. I let them stay over with uh, mom for a few days um, while that was drying. Um, and I got the rest of the box put together, uh, drew out the design freehand, kind of like what I'm doing with this drum here on the table in the smaller box here. Um, all four sides drawn in, painted, um, got the lid fitted after it had shrunk considerably, um, and loaded up into the car uh, at like 12.15, and then drove straight downtown uh, with it. The ceremony started at one. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, we got that done just in time. Um, and it was, it's a big box. Um, that's an eight foot tall house post. The box is 24 inches long, um, about 15 inches tall, and uh, about 12 inches deep. Um, so it's a fairly sizable box. And uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun to work on. It was one of two that they had me make. Uh, I had a little bit more time on the second one than I did on this <laughs> one. Um, but it was really fun. And the kids absolutely loved their house post. Uh, they were waiting for the second one to be finished, a Raven House post, and we were going to do a gifting ceremony for that one in May, but there ended up being a death in the family, so that ceremony has been postponed until September. Um, we're, and so this one is currently sitting in the principal's office uh, where all the kids can come in to see it there until it's ready to be installed. Uh, hopefully this fall. Um, my first total full. Thank you. So, could you go back to the last slide? Maybe. Maybe. Hey, maybe. Okay, <laughs> that's good enough. Um, uh, the, the wings look like a raven symbol. Well, it's pointing down. But they're not meant to be. Um. Uh, they're wings. Eagles and ravens have wings, and there's not too much uh, you can do about how they're designed. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. To me, it looks more like the, ra the eagles that I see standing on the uh, top of the light posts on Egan Drive after a big rain. Yeah. And they're just kind of like <laughs> drip drying. <laughs> Yeah. So can you talk about the symbolism from top down? Oh, yeah, totally. Um, so uh, 
we wanted to do an eagle post and a raven post. And so to, to create balance um, and create kind of a lovebird's design, which is a symbol of balance and unity. So this is the eagle post here. We have the children here dancing on uh, the box of knowledge. Um, the box of knowledge has become known as the box of knowledge from the story of um, when Raven uh, stole the stole the sun, when he stole the box holding daylight in it uh -huh. and releasing it into the world um, as kind of a symbol of uh, bringing knowledge into the world so that we can see what everything is. Okay, thank you. Uh -huh. And the other uh, house post is more of a collaborative piece. Um, a friend of mine started it last summer and I was brought in to finish it for him. Um, and so we've got a raven on the top and uh, kind of more in with the story, we have a grandfather here in the middle and then two children um, standing back to back wearing um, a different set of dance robes, um, more similar to the robes in the case back here. Uh, one eagle and one raven. And they're also standing on top of a bentwood box, um, which I had some more experienced students working on with me, and they were able to do the design work on the box itself, um, but I did the design for the robes um, for them. Uh, and that was that was a lot of fun to work with the kids on that piece. So I'm looking forward to um, seeing that brought in with the, the Eagle Post finally uh, this fall. Um, is, any other questions? Is there a meaning in the traditional use of red and turquoise and black? Yes. That means that those were the colors we had available. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and because those were the colors that we had available, most easily available, um, this artwork developed with it. And so even with the, um, the addition of more modern style colors being brought in, um, these are the colors that uh, we prefer to use most of the time um, because it's a means of respecting our ancestors and create a continuing dialogue uh, from our ancestors with the work that we're doing today for our descendants. What was the reasoning or the symbolism behind the colors not being able to touch the light? Uh, that was something that had developed with the, um, the weaving itself, the textile uh, work that had been done. Um, and that was, I'm not exactly sure what the meaning was specifically about it. I didn't get the chance to talk to Lily too much about it. Um, but she said that the, the, those colors were not technically allowed to interact with the white. They were to be contained within themselves. Um, it's uh, one of those questions that's on my long list of questions for uh, Chilcat Weavers. Yes. Um, any other questions? Yes. So, in Totem Park, we're talking about some of the distinctive features between uh, Wingate and Haida poles. Are there distinctive features sort of unique to Tsimshian? Um, just different blocking in styles of some of the faces. Um, my particular style for blocking in faces is um, not as quite different from even some of the uh, more traditional Simpsian style poles, um, but it's still a Simpsian style face. Um, and uh, there's a few other minor differences in style and technique, and it also varies from artist to artist. Um, there's some really great uh, posts that have been recently carved in Juno um, by um, uh, a Haida Simpsian and Thinget artist. And I think the one that's probably the most traditional to the culture is the Simpsian pole, um, because the Haida pole and the uh, Klinga pole um, are very, very modern in how their the, the visualization of the piece is created. So, yeah. Uh, any other questions? So. Um, 
As for the, the vertical cracks, um, when you uh, when you set it up in the house pool, do you put a vacuum pull into into it, kind of like how these are in the park? Um, is there a pull to support it, or does this, this go into the wall? This is a called a false house post, so it would be set up and fastened to an internal house post in a house setting. These will probably be bolted to the wall. To the wall. Um, but in a traditional plank house, um, they, these would be fastened to the support beams inside the house, which is one of the reasons why these would have been hollowed out in the back. Um, otherwise, it would be just a full house post, in which case the post itself is carved. Yes? Um, yeah, uh, red cedar is much lighter, so much lighter than yellow cedar, mm -hmm. so much easier to transport around and to put up, um, especially if you're working with a really big pole, uh, a 40 foot pole in red cedar, uh, probably weighs at least a ton less than a big pole in yellow cedar. Um, and that's a considerable amount of weight. Easier to carve? Um, if your tools are sharp enough. <laughs> uh, no, with red cedar, um, you typically have to make sure that your tools are extra sharp. Um, the grain in yellow cedar is a little bit more even. Uh, it's a slightly more dense wood, but if the grain is even with red cedar, you have hard and soft grain. So the darker lines are hard and then the softer, the lighter greens are, are soft. Um, and so it can be really easy to, to break the grain if your knife uh, is not sharp enough. Hey, well, what yeah. about checking? Did they check about the same? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Did they? Yeah. Yep. Um, most carvers don't worry about cracks and stuff because the tree is, is alive, it moves. It breathes, um, it takes in moisture, it puts out moisture. So it's, the wood is always moving. Uh, I've known some people who tried complaining about the cracks on totem poles and it's like, well, you stand outside 24 hours a day and see how well your skin bears um, without a constant supply of lotion, yeah. So, any other questions? Yes? Do all your students stay with the project when they came to the end? Yes, they did. Until the gifting ceremony, they all bailed because they were afraid I was going to make them give a speech. <laughs> yes. Um, and that was exactly what they told me afterwards. Um, I kind of gave them a really hard time for that. Uh, <laughs> said it wasn't going to be long, just hi, my name is. Um, but yeah, they were terrified of public speaking. Mm. <laughs> Which is why, you know, they were really shy whenever I took out the camera. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yes? Um, so it sounds like your, your carvers might be shy people. Did you see growth in, in those students? Oh, yes. Like in their... Um, they, they did a lot of growing, um, they don't like to be singled out, they're usually uh, pretty involved in dance groups, um, but when you're in a dance group you're not by yourself, you're surrounded by other people, and so everyone's attention is not just on you, kind of like me right now, um, <laughs> where I'm the one thing that everybody is staring at, you know, so for a lot of people that's quite nerve-wracking. Um, I have kids and kind of got used to it. Yep. All right. Is that it? Thank you guys very much for coming. Um, I've had a great time finally talking about uh, a piece of my art, as Gustavo knows. I don't do that very often. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.